Washington Journal continues. On the House floor, lawmakers are continuing their debate today, which began yesterday on NASA funding, and we're going to spend the next uh, 35 minutes taking a look at uh, the space agency, what its mission has been over the last uh, several decades, and where it's going as we move into the next century. We want to begin, though, by taking a, a quick look at some numbers to give you a sense of comparison. When NASA first uh, established back in 1959 and 1960, its operating budget was about a half billion dollars. And as you can see over the years, that has increased rather significantly. In 1965, it was about five and a half billion dollars. It then dropped in the 1970s to 3.7 billion in 1970 and 3.2 billion in 1975. As we move into 1980, it was back uh, to the same level of where it was in 1965. In 1985, the NASA budget went up to 7.6 billion dollars in the most recent figures that we have, a budget of $14.5 billion. Andrew Lawler is a reporter with Science Magazine. Good morning to you. Good morning, Steve. What is NASA's mission? Well, NASA's mission traditionally was to win the Cold War and to do that by uh, beating the Russians, by showing America's technological prowess. Um, however, with the end of the Cold War, NASA's been going through um, a bit of a midlife crisis, trying to decide what is it supposed to do now. And the administrator, Dan Golden, uh, has decided that science is one thing that the agency should really focus on at, at this point. Um, that's why you see a lot of emphasis on the Mars missions, which have uh, been much in the news in the past, uh, past week or so. Uh, so NASA's struggling to come out of uh, this period of, of turmoil following the Challenger disaster and following the end of the Cold War. And the, uh, the new chief of NASA is trying to, to set the agency on a, on a different course that will be very different from the one that uh, President Kennedy envisioned when uh, he decided that people should go to the moon. Let me get your reaction to this morning's headline in the Christian Science Monitor on this Wednesday. Uh, the story by Peter Spotts says that the success of the Pathfinder mission on Mars is already prompting JPL engineers. What are JPL engineers? Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is one of uh, NASA's centers that's located in uh, California. Those engineers to begin redesigning coming unmanned missions to look more closely at what must be done to put people on the red planet. That's something that uh, has been talked about for years. In fact, 1989, uh, President Bush suggested that uh, the United States should go to Mars. Um, however, Congress said, forget it, far too expensive. And since then, there has been really very little work that's been done on this. And what you see now are a lot of unmanned missions to Mars, robotic missions to Mars. And I think for the next 10, 20 years, that's all you're going to see. Has the, the Cold War, which obviously has now ended, but has that played a key role in trying to uh, boost what NASA has been doing over the last 10 to 15 years? Um, well, ironically, the Challenger disaster resulted in NASA's budget being doubled uh, since 1986 it, it, up until a couple of years ago. The budget was increasing uh, radically. Uh, but what's happened now with the problems with uh, the budget deficit, et cetera, uh, the budget is slowly beginning to decline. So I don't think you're going to see any you know, huge, major human missions to other planets anytime in the near future. Where is the space shuttle right now? The uh, space shuttle is orbiting. And I ask the question because distance-wise, the shuttle is where in proportion to the Earth compared to the Pathfinder, which is how many million miles uh, from the planet Earth? Well, I don't know exactly where Mars stands in relation to the, the Earth and the Sun at this point, but the shuttle is about 176 miles or so uh, up in space, so it's very much within Earth's orbit. Uh, the Pathfinder, of course, is uh, quite a far distance away. It was launched last uh, November, last December, and uh, only reached Mars a couple of weeks ago. So it's been traveling at high speed since then. The shuttle, of course, can be launched within minutes. It can be in orbit. Our phone lines are open. The number's on the bottom of the screen. You can also fax or email us at our address on the World Wide Web, uh, www.cspan.org. You can also uh, click us on if you get AOL. And our first call is from Washington. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question was, um uh, the following. I'd like to know why does NASA have uh, so many centers disseminated all across the, the country? They could probably cut down on, the, on the, the cost by having like one big center where, you know, uh, most of the things could be located. And the other thing is um, I really think that, uh, you know, resources should be um, uh, uh, put to NASA so they can uh, find out what's out there. I really believe that there's life out there. How many operating centers are there? There are, about a, there are about a dozen NASA centers. And the problem with trying to close a NASA center is the same problem you have in trying to, to close a military base. Uh, it's simply 
politically very, very difficult. And NASA also argues that its centers do different things. The Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, for example, focuses on human spaceflight. Um, you have the Lewis uh, Center in Cleveland, which focuses on um, microgravity research. You have Marshall Space Flight Center, which focuses on propulsion, which built the, helped build the Saturn V rocket that took humans to the moon. So every center does something a little different, and they all have very strong political constituencies in, in Congress. Created in 1958, why was it formed? Uh, clearly, it was formed because of Sputnik. Uh, the United States was, was uh, terrified when the Russians launched Sputnik, and there was a feeling that the U.S. was lagging behind in what was perceived as the, the pinnacle of technological achievement. And as a result, uh, the Congress uh, and the White House decided it was time to form an agency, and they formed a civilian agency specifically in order to separate it from the military space program and show the world that the United States was interested in peaceful endeavors. This story continues uh, to generate an awful lot of headlines, but what else is NASA doing that uh, won't make the cover of Newsweek magazine? Oh, there are a lot of science projects that don't get a lot of attention because they don't send back uh, beautiful pictures like Pathfinder has. Uh, there are a variety of satellites that are exploring um, x-rays, uh, ultraviolet, all kinds of waves that beyond that which the human eye can see. As a result, you don't see as much publicity, but uh, a lot of the data coming back is, is creating what some are calling the golden age of astronomy. Uh, the question is whether or not the funds will be there in the next five, ten years to continue to build and launch these missions. Framingham, Massachusetts, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have a question about the uh, funding figures that were put on the screen earlier mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Sure, we'll put them back on for you. Now, are these figures adjusted for inflation? No, they're not. Uh, those figures are, uh, are not adjusted for inflation, so you have to take that into account, certainly. Okay, because, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable then for the $14.5 billion could be a reasonable number if you go back and compare it to the 1960 number, you know, accounted for inflation. Mm -hmm. Paulo, since you brought up the numbers, we also have some additional figures, and you can stay on the line and follow up if you want. Uh, we've taken the fiscal year for 96, 97, and 98 and kind of broken it down in certain key areas, including the human space flight program, which uh, has stayed about the same if you look at the figures over the last uh, three years. And then the science, aeronautics, and technology budget, the mission support budget, and the overall total NASA budget. And as you can see, uh, and Andrew Lawler, please jump in, that it has not changed significantly, has it? No, it has not. Um, the, the NASA budget is divided into the money that goes for the space shuttle and the space station, that is human spaceflight programs, and then for science programs like Mission to Planet Earth, which is supposed to, uh, to uh, monitor the environment, as well as uh, the space science programs like the one, uh, the one that went to Mars. And then you also have a lot of technology uh, programs that NASA is working on, as well as um, aeronautics. Can't forget that aeronautics is uh, one of the A's in, in NASA that's often forgotten. Uh, as a result of the budget, though, not growing. In fact, it's been shrinking some. Uh, it's going to shrink another $100 million likely this, uh, this coming year. Um, you're seeing everyone scrambling around within NASA to compete for those dollars. And uh, it's very tense because people don't want to cut the shuttle. Uh, the danger could be that uh, there could be a uh, technical problem, and you might find that you shorted the program money. Space Station has enormous political support. Space Science is doing very well. Uh, we've seen from the, from the publicity of the recent week. So it makes it very difficult for Congress and for NASA to choose where exactly to cut within that budget. One of the top tourist attractions uh, here in Washington is the uh, Air and Space Museum, which is part of the Smithsonian. And joining us live over there is Lori Garver, who is with the Office of Policy and Planning with NASA. Good morning to you. Good morning. Where is NASA going? What's its future? Uh, NASA is boldly opening the air and space frontier. Uh, we have had a rich history. I think uh, something that Andrew Lawler said we had gone through after the Challenger accident, um, a rethinking of where we were going. But we've had more than 75 missions since the Challenger accident. This recent mission to Mars was only begun three years ago. And we have, I think, a very clear vision of where the agency is going. We are opening the air and space frontier. Are you getting more information uh, on science and space exploration from Mars than you're getting from the space shuttle or vice versa? Uh, that's a difficult comparison to make because the types of science we're getting are so very different. Uh, NASA has four enterprises, space science, human exploration, aeronautics, and mission to planet Earth. All very valuable science is gained from all four of those enterprises. Why Mars? 
Mars, I think, has tantalized uh, humanity's imagination for centuries, literally since we have discovered the planet. I think, although we are sending a robot now and have intentions of sending robotic spacecraft over the next 10 years, Mars is exciting because we feel we can go there as humans. We uh, have similar information from other planets, but if we know we as a species can never attempt a landing, we aren't as interested. I think the hundreds of millions of hits on the internet on our web pages have shown the public is vastly interested in uh, the planet Mars. Andrew Lawler, based on current technology, if uh, astronauts were to go to Mars, how long would it take for them to get there? Oh, probably take a year or two. It uh, depends on the propulsion technology that you choose. But I have a question for, for Lori. Lori, could you tell us how serious NASA is about pursuing human exploration of Mars? There's talk of some funding for pro for for studies, but beyond that, is there is there anything more concrete? Well, as you mentioned earlier, the Bush administration had a specific plan to go back to the moon and Mars with humans, and I would say since the 80s, really, there have been plans within NASA. Dan Golden has been challenging people since he began at NASA five years ago to think about reducing the cost, reducing the risk, uh, working on the life sciences that you would need to go to Mars, and I believe that that effort is alive and well at the Jet Propulsion Lab, at the Johnson Space Center. We have uh, in the tens of people who've been working on that. Will we be ready if the leadership of this country decides we want to go to Mars? NASA wants to be ready with a program vastly less than we were able to tell the public we could do it for in 1989. And Mars, of course, is about 310 million miles away. The Pathfinder uh, took off on December 4th, 1996, so it's been about six months. Would it take longer for a manned mission? It would definitely take longer because you're talking about a much larger spacecraft that would requ require more propulsion. So you're not going to be uh, traveling at the same kind of speeds that you could send Pathfinder, unless uh, NASA comes up with uh, some new propulsion system, but that would does, take a lot of money. It does depend on the propulsion system, but it definitely should not take a year or two. We think we could get humans there in eight months. How much money would it cost? Uh, at this point, the NASA administrator has challenged uh, NASA employees to look at reducing the number well below $100 billion, getting it down even below $50 billion would be a huge challenge, but it's something uh, we're looking at. And Lori, how quickly could it be done if the President and Congress were to say, okay, go for it? How long would it take to actually land someone on Mars? We feel an aggressive program could be done within 10 years of given the mandate. If at the turn of the century, the leadership of this country decides that is a priority, uh, we feel we could uh, launch a mission within 10 years. Sarasota, Florida, good morning. Yeah, we, we need to thank uh, Orson Welles probably for the uh, War of the Worlds and the interest in Mars from his uh, radio broadcast from the 1930s. Uh, the point I wanted to make, we have this, uh, the shuttle operation has been going so successful and it's, uh, we, they've uh, established time on the Mir uh, space probe out in space. Uh, it seems like to me that it would take just a few extra dollars to create a, a, uh, a spacecraft that could go to Mars and return to Mars within a, a 16 or 17 month period, go and come back within a 16 or 17 month period. Because this, uh, our, uh, our shuttle so far has been so successful. The only, of course, disaster was, was the Challenger. And, uh, and I think uh, we've gone beyond that. I think we've gone to the point to where it's almost an everyday thing that we, send the, that we can send one of our shuttles up into space. And, and with this technology and the advance that we have in this te technology in this area that we could progress to going to Mars, if we really, like, like uh, the lady said, put, put our foot down and really started working on the plan. Lori Garver? I think it's true uh, that we could go to Mars with current technology. We know more about Mars than we did about the moon when President Kennedy laid out that goal. The question is one of accepting risk. And while we know we can't eliminate all risk, certainly in any type of space travel, uh, we would like to mitigate the risk and drastically reduce the cost. So we're working on technologies to do that as well as to understand more about the human physiology involved in such a long duration Mars mission, uh, but it is really something that is acceptable. We have established criteria for a decision to go to Mars, but that is not NASA's decision. That is the country's. Based on what you know right now, what's the temperature on Mars and uh, is it uh, habitable for mankind? 
Uh, the temperature of Mars has been between 10 and negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Certainly that is one, one of the concerns, but there are many others uh, that you would have to accept in going to Mars. You would need a complete artificial uh, environment for breathing, uh, water recycling. Those are all technologies that NASA is working on. And Andrew Lawler, what we've seen so far have been pictures of rocks and things like that. What would we get out of a hundred billion dollar mission to Mars? Well, I think this is exactly the question that NASA is struggling with and that uh, the country is, is beginning to think about, and that is, why go to Mars? Uh, certainly the technology uh, could be available with enough money to get there. You know, the United States went to the moon, uh, today's July 16th, I guess it was 28 years ago today that Apollo 11 was launched. There's no question the U.S. probably could do it with other uh, countries probably participating. The question is why? And that's something that uh, divides uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, it's something that there's no real clear answer to yet. And I think that's the reason why you haven't seen a big political push to actually make the funding available. Stratford, Connecticut, good morning. Uh, good morning. I uh, just wanted to make a couple comments. Sure. Um, thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, 1957 today, uh, Major John Glenn, Marine Major, uh, set a record flying across the country. And at that time, he was also experimenting with the X-1. Uh, but it was a three-hour flight, that he, a three-hour, 20-minute flight across the country. But it seems like we had more direction at that time uh, when NASA first began and when Kennedy said we'd be on the moon at the end of the decade, we were. And it doesn't seem as though anyone is setting any direction to NASA. And it seems that the attitude has changed from uh, very professional to one that is not so professional. And uh, sometimes it's irritating to see people fooling around in the shuttle, you know, throwing, making bubbles and so forth. But... Uh, and it seems like the flight has to be politically correct sometimes as opposed to a very professional uh, military style that it had been before. And I'm not saying that it has to be a military flight, but uh, what are we seeking and what are the goals? It seems like that's often skipped uh, when we're talking about NASA. Lori Thank Garver? Yes, Thanks, caller. I do think that NASA suffered from a lack of direction, as we've talked about early on the program, um, in the 80s and during the shuttle accident. We do not, I don't believe, suffer from a lack of direction at this time. As I mentioned, the four strategic enterprises in aeronautics, we are spending money to do test vehicles, reducing the cost of space transportation, uh, increasing the safety of aircraft, a very uh, large goals that have been mandated by this administration. In space science, the Mars exploration is just a piece of an overall program that the space science enterprise has. Mission of Planet Earth, also an aggressive program to monitor global change. We, in the human exploration development of space area, which is often the most visible, have a very strong program. The space station is being built at this time. It will be starting to be launched within a year. And we uh, are having many of the shuttle missions and this phase one shuttle Mir program all in preparation for the space station, which of course is in preparation for larger exploratory human missions. So I would not say we lack from direction. And just one point to clarify on the numbers when we talk about why go to Mars and if we would spend the money that we did when we went to the moon, the numbers that you have at that time, what we're spending on the lunar program was 4% of the federal budget. Right now we're spending less than eight tenths of a percent uh, of the federal budget. And what we're trying to do is get the Mars mission costs down to within our existing budget. If we could do that, we think there would be a criteria saying we ought to go. So bottom line, from your standpoint, should the emphasis be on manned or unmanned missions? Clearly we need both. Uh, robotic exploration is something that we now have the technology to, to do. And throughout history, we have not had the technology. We would have sent robotic explorers before we went and risked human lives. But I believe that it is all about sending humans eventually, and we will do that when it's safe, when we're ready, and when we have a reason to go. What's your own background in this? How did you get interested in space exploration and NASA? I've certainly had a lifelong interest. I grew up in the 60s when humans were walking on the moon. Uh, I have worked for John Glenn on Capitol Hill, and I've worked for a space advocacy organization that promotes uh, uh, creating a spacefaring civilization. Lori Garver joining us from the uh, Air and Space Museum here in Washington. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Andrew Lawler, did you want to follow up on her points? Uh, no, I think, I think she pretty much covered it. I think today's an important day for NASA because the, the space station for the first time is not going to be challenged uh, on the House floor. And that is a, a clear sign that both the Republicans and Democrats, White House and, and 
Congress uh, agree that the space station is, uh, is something that, that should be done. It's on very firm political footing, but I think it remains to be seen whether or not NASA can pull this out uh, with the Russians. It's going to be extremely challenging. And, of course, we're talking about uh, this very issue because of the debate uh, going on in the House floor, which, which began yesterday and will continue today. Are there any obstacles that uh, NASA should expect to come from, the, from lawmakers? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Chairman Z the chairman of the Science Committee, uh, Jim Zensenbrenner, is going to uh, be supporting an amendment today that would take away $100 million that NASA wants to make up for the fact that the Russians have taken a little bit longer than anticipated to build their hardware. Um, and Congress is not really happy with uh, the situation with the Russians. And as a result, uh, that is putting the space station in some jeopardy, although I don't think it's a, a fatal problem. It's definitely a sign that Congress is very, very nervous about the costs associated with this very expensive program. In this view from uh, Jay Oaks, a viewer faxes in, why go to Mars? The same reason man climbs mountains, because it's there. Perhaps manifest destiny isn't confined to a mere planet. Lee, Massachusetts, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have... I thought I only had one comment, but but the, the comment Miss Scarver made uh, about um, we were unable to do robotic exploration earlier, I, I don't think is correct. I think we could have done much more without uh, putting people in space uh, using using technology much earlier than this. Uh, the, but the other comment, uh, both uh, your visitor, whose name I didn't get, and Ms. Garver, uh, left the impression that it would certainly be possible to have a manned space flight that would take on the order of seven or eight months. I, I think what they're neglecting is the fact that we were able to do a seven months on the, on the Mars lander because this was machinery and a, well able to take... Uh, forces on the order of 20G, where most humans, I would suspect, would be limited to something in the order of 3 to 5Gs. Uh, so it, it would take a considerably longer than the seven months to get to Mars, as well as to get back. Uh, I'd, I'd appreciate your comment on, on either of these. Andrew Lawler? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right. I think seven months is probably uh, a pretty short span. And you're right, the Pathfinder was able to zoom there and then it didn't have to really break. It used the orbit to skip around uh, in order to slow itself down. Obviously, a, a human mission is not going to do that. Uh, the other big problem is what do you do when you get there? You've been in, in space, say, eight months, say, a year. And the human body begins to degrade when it's in zero gravity. Uh, it's a big problem. When the Russians come back from the Mir space station, you, know, you see them carrying them out and putting them in chairs because it's very difficult and dangerous for them to walk. When the astronauts arrive, uh, if they arrive on Mars, then you're not going to have a, a, a team that will be there to provide medical care. This is a, a real problem, not to mention the psychological effects of simply being confined for that period of time and such a long distance from the Earth. So these are some of the non-technological issues which I think uh, still have to be dealt with before NASA really gets serious about a Mars mission. We continue uh, back in the Air and Space Museum, and joining us is Robert Park, who is the uh, Washington office director of the American Physical Society. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, one of the issues that we've been discussing back and forth is uh, manned missions versus robotic missions. Which do you think makes more sense? I, I was a little puzzled by the discussion of, uh, of going to Mars. We're on Mars right now. If we had an astronaut there, he would be locked in his spacesuit. He would, uh, he would have no sense of touch, no sense of smell. There's nothing to hear on Mars. The only sense he would have is the sense of sight. And the eyes on Sojourner are better than a human's eyes. So we really have no need to put a human there. We're doing fine with our robots. In fact, the human space program has become the biggest drag on space exploration. It's enormously costly, and it's the one thing really holding back space exploration. You have an editorial that appeared in Saturday's New York Times, and I just want to read one part of what you wrote and uh, get your reaction. You say that the Pathfinder mission cost about a fourth as much as the current mission of the shuttle Columbia. And yet, while Sojourner is exploring Mars 120 million miles from Earth, Columbia is about as far from Earth as Baltimore is from New York, Still in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, Columbia is dodging the garbage left behind by hundreds of previous NASA missions. That's right. And, uh, and, and somehow that is represented as exploration. The, the one thing that the, uh, the space shuttle and the space station do not prepare us for 
is how to deal with the radiation going to Mars. That seems to be the one that nobody mentions. There's a recent study out by the National Research Council dealing with just what that radiation is, and it's enormous. We don't know how to deal with it. It's both solar and galactic radiation. We can deal with the solar flares by building a sort of lead-lined coffin that, uh, that the crew members can jump into when, uh, when there's a warning that there's a, a, uh, a solar flare. We have no way of dealing with the continuous galactic radiation, which is high energy and high mass. We really don't know what that kind of radiation does, but the suspicion is that it's extremely damaging to the central nervous system. Uh, and you're no better off when you get there. We're protected both in the space station and on Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. That's why we don't have to worry about this particle radiation, at least to the same extent. But when you, uh, when you get out in space or on Mars, which has no magnetic field, you're faced with this continuous, very high level of radiation. We don't know how to deal that with that. It is the big unanswered question so far, and we're not sending anybody to Mars till that question's answered. Looking back in hindsight, did it make sense to send uh, a manned mission to the moon? Uh, oh, I think it did, but, uh, but you have to remember that the principal purpose of that was as a, as a weapon, really, in the Cold War. This was a symbolic mission, and it was enormously successful. It did exactly what it was intended to do. In the meantime, however, we have made enormous progress in robotics. In fact, our robots get better every day. Human beings haven't changed in 35,000 years. What we've got is what we're stuck with when it comes to human beings. But They're I, pretty fragile. I, Bob, I have to say, though, that I, I'm not quite sure you can you can separate the robotic program from the human program because the fact is that without the Apollo program, it's quite possible that uh, space science would not have gotten the kind of support it has uh, at NASA over the past few years. In fact, the budgets track pretty closely. The more money for human spaceflight, the more money for space science. You know, roughly that seems to be the case. Do you think that that the the political uh, political fanfare that accompanies human spaceflight can, in the end, help the robotic space programs? Well, that's always been the argument. Uh, uh, the unstated argument of NASA has always been that without humans in space, the public simply won't support this program. I think actually that the, uh, uh, if one piece of information that we've gotten from, uh, uh, from Pathfinder is that the public is very interested in robotic spaceflight. I mean, this is a new, this is a new time. They, we're, we're raising a bunch of cyber kids. They, uh, they're, they're as excited about robotics as I was when I saw a human being step off on the moon. Robert Park is also a professor of physics at the University of Maryland. What is the American Physical Society? Uh, the American Physical Society is the principal membership organization of professional physicists in the United States. And Andrew Lawler works for uh, Science Magazine, and we'll show you a look at uh, two of its most recent covers, and we'll get a call from Philadelphia. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is for Mr. Lawler. Um, you had mentioned uh, a little while ago about the space station that they're building, and I was wondering if you could tell us um, how much, it, um, if you have this information, how much it's going to cost, and where um, they're going to launch it to, and how many people will be on it, just general information about it. Right. It's a, it's a hotly debated topic as to how much the space station is going to cost. NASA says uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, I think, about $17 billion, but if you add in a lot of the extras, uh, it comes up to maybe $30 billion, and if you add in everything that is space shuttle flights, et cetera, the number is considerably higher. Um, so it's hard to say exactly how much it's going to cost. Uh, but they're spending $2 billion a year on the program. That's, a, that's one firm figure uh, in order to get the thing built. It's going to be launched uh, starting, uh, the plan is starting next year. They'll piece it together in orbit. Uh, it'll be launched uh, in pieces both from uh, Cape Canaveral, from uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, uh, and from uh, Kazakhstan, where the Russians have their Baikonur launch site. Uh, the Russians will be contributing large pieces of hardware. That is assuming that the money is there and they're able to, uh, to meet the U.S. Uh, when it comes to putting this together in orbit. Europeans and Japanese and Canadians are also involved. They'll be providing uh, large pieces of hardware later on. It'll take until the year 2002 to actually complete the station as it's um, currently planned. Mr. Park, for you, uh, a fax from Curtis Dean of Spencer, Iowa, wondering what NASA plans are for the space shuttle, uh, when it would retire the shuttle program, and what its replacement for human flight would be. Well, you'd have to ask the, uh, the NASA people what their plans are, but there certainly is a desire to replace the shuttle with a different launch system. It has, uh, it has been the most expensive means of launching things into space that was ever conceived. 
and uh, and in that sense, it has uh, uh, it has been a failure. It was it was de intended to cut the cost of launch. It has increased it enormously. So the sooner we can get away from the shuttle, the better off we're going to be. Have there been any positive aspects of the shuttle missions? Oh, oh, look, you can't spend that much money and not learn a lot of things. And uh, and of course, they've learned things from the shuttle mission, but. Uh, but all considered, it's been a terribly expensive way to get a, a rather meager amount of information. Most of the, uh, the great advances that have taken place, both in space science and in the technology of space that has given us so many benefits on Earth, uh, now with the global positioning system that was gr the, maybe the fastest growing technology in the world. But, uh, but this has all come from the robotic program. It has not come from the, uh, from the man in space program. If you had the ability to invest NASA dollars, whether it be a large project or a number of smaller projects, where would you spend the money? What would the goal be? Oh, I, I, th I think what's going on right now, I mean, the, uh, the future we're seeing right now on Mars. It's marvelous. This, uh, this robot is doing a fantastic job. If we got to the point where we could send human beings to Mars, I think by that point we'd realize that the, the robots are doing the job just fine. There wouldn't be any point in it. Houston, Texas, good morning. Hello there. Your, the answer to your question to follow up the space shuttle would be probably something like the Venture Star. Um, Japan is working on the Hope. Europe is working on Hermes. We have four space shuttles in and the plan was $8.8 .8 million. It has increased a little since then, but every single dollar that we spend on that is absolutely worth it. There's long-run payoff for everything, and, and ENIAC is proof of it. But now I have three computers in my room alone. Um, we need to continue this, but we need to get a little bit more on track. We're trying to talk about putting a human being on Mars, but we haven't put a human being on the moon in my lifetime. Andrew Lawler? Uh, that's definitely true. I, I, don't, I, I think that the political reality, I keep coming back to that because uh, uh, I think a lot of this is a, both a financial question and a policy question that NASA can't answer, uh, is whether or not the, the American public feels that spending large sums of money uh, to send humans uh, into space is worth it. So far, when it comes to the shuttle program and now the space station program, the politicians have said, yes, we think that it is worth doing. Uh, whether or not they'll take the next step and say, let's go on to another mission, I think that will wait until the space station is uh, fully assembled in orbit. I don't think you can expect uh, any uh, major new project coming out of NASA in terms of human space flight until the uh, space station is complete. Melbourne, Florida, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was listening to the, the physicists over there and I think long after both of us are a piece of dust on the earth, there will be men flying around. I know when I was growing up in the Buck Jones uh, era, Buck Rogers era, that who, who believed that would happen? And darn if the space shuttles don't look like the stuff that goes around the earth now. Could I comment on that? Certainly. Yeah, it would, when, when I was a boy at the same time, uh, there were canals on Mars and there were swamps on Venus. And, uh, and we have to take advantage of what we've learned in the meantime. There aren't any swamps on Venus, there aren't any canals on Mars, and space is not the environment we imagined it to be in the Buck Rogers era. As we approach the 21st century, you're both science experts, and uh, Mr. Parks, we'll start with you. What are the big unanswered questions? Oh, there are, there, are, there are any number of great unanswered questions, but certainly the search for life is one of the big ones. And uh, uh, it, it's terribly exciting. We, the great advances in human understanding have been to understand our place in the universe and, uh, and how the universe works. And the, many of these have been sort of humbling. And certainly finding that life is common in the universe would be a humbling experience. But I think it's terribly important and I think human beings want to know. And if you're asked uh, the size of the universe, how would you answer that? Uh, look, it's big. <laughs> And, uh, and we're seeing almost to the edge of what we can see because the, uh, uh, if it's much further away, things will be receding from us at greater than the speed of light. So uh, we're seeing almost to the edge of the universe now. I think one of the most exciting things going on now in several fields of science is that there's an attempt by the cosmologists and astrophysicists, those people who study the universe and things far, far away and how the universe evolved, down to the biologists who are exploring evolution. Uh, the potential for uh, past life on Mars that uh, came out to last August uh, in the Mars meteorite that was found here on Earth that 
possibly could contain fossils, I think has sparked a lot of interest in the scientific community in getting these people who typically work in different disciplines, have very little to do one, with one another, uh, to get them to work together to try and come up with some common themes about how not only the universe evolved, but how life itself evolved out of that. And I think that's a very exciting new field that uh, is slowly coming into existence. Robert Park, who is the uh, office director here in Washington for the American Physical Society, also a professor at the University of Maryland. Thanks for being with us. Surely. Pleasure. And we'll get a call from Morris, Michigan. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I got a more of a question comment in um, relation to uh, uh, budget talks that are going to be happening. Of course, you said that the uh, um, Department of Defense uh, are going to be closed off to C-SPAN due to obviously a secret information. Um, I'm curious if people are looking at combining the Department of Defense and NASA budget, uh, possibly for robot exploration or space station, what have you. Um, just a question, curiosity. Uh, the only thing that's happened along those lines is that the uh, Defense Department has pushed uh, a couple of missions. One, Clementine, was a, a small spacecraft that uh, was funded by the Defense Department uh, that visited uh, the moon and went on to try to visit an asteroid, didn't quite make it, but uh, that was a very pathbreaking mission. But NASA and the Defense Department are different cultures. They don't particularly get along very well together. I think their relationship has improved, but I would, I would not see any time in the near future any kind of merging of uh, these two very different agencies. Who on Capitol Hill are among NASA's staunchest supporters and fiercest critics? Mm -hmm. I think the, probably the strongest supporter would have to be uh, George Brown. He's a congressman from California, former director of the science, former chairman of the Science Committee. Uh, he has always been a strong supporter of the agency and a strong supporter particularly of the space science budget. Uh, when it comes to critics, uh, no doubt it is uh, Congressman Tim Romer from uh, Indiana, Democrat from Indiana. He will be one of the people proposing an amendment to take away $100 million from uh, the space station program today. He traditionally has been the one who has led the fight against the space station program uh, and a a couple of years he came very, very close to succeeding, uh, but now it looks like the, the, there is very solid support for that program. We have time for one more call. Gainesville, Florida, if you could be brief. Good morning. Yes, how you doing? Thank you for Z-SPAN. I want to make a quick comment about the funding for NASA in general. Um, I think that going into space, it, it opens up a new frontier and opportunities for people that never existed before. It's just like Christopher Columbus discovering the new world. Um, New opportunities for people are opened up. It will help provide jobs for people here on Earth. Um, and uh, just the research to go to these places provides materials and devices and, and machinery that, that never existed before. And then the public sector takes that and turns it into useful items for home. So um, the money that we spend on the space program is returned to us uh, fivefold. Sorry, I'm nervous. I've That's never okay. been on before. Th thanks yeah. for calling, because I wanted to follow up with the facts that is somewhat related on space exploration. PB of New York says the only way to find out about the effects of space radiation on the human body is to send a human into space. Your comment on this fax or the caller's comments? Um, when it comes to radiation, it certainly is a serious problem that will have to be explored in depth before people are, are sent uh, sent to Mars. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but there's no data. There's very little data on exactly what the effects are. There's some preliminary data which shows it could be a very serious problem. Uh, I think that, that you can come up with lots of problems when it comes to sending uh, humans uh, beyond, beyond the Earth. The question is whether or not people will be excited enough and interested enough to uh, call their politicians and say, yes, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to focus our attention. Uh, as of now, that, that's simply not happening yet. Andrew Lawler is a uh, reporter for Science Magazine following the NASA budget debate on Capitol Hill today. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, Steve.